I was super unorganized for this trip and I had no idea what to do in Kent. As there are so many great places to visit from castles, beaches, harbors and coves, or if you go inland with its lush rolling countryside filled with orchards, vineyards and quaint little villages. These are all things that make up for a perfect trip in my opinion. When I had to choose where to go, it was so hard. I settled with Whistable, Canterbury and Margate. As it was the summer, I had to go to a beach destination because it's England and we have to make the most of sunshine. Starting the road trip with a day trip to Whistable. All my trips need to start off with coffee and I think I now have a knack for finding the best coffee places. Scandy Cool Cafe Blueprint on Oxford Street is part espresso bar and part bookshop. Offering their own speciality roast, it's perfect for a caffeine pick-me-up. Walking through to the centre, I discovered local street art by Catman. On the high street next to Boots is a humorous depiction of Her Majesty being towed along by her corgis. On the Pilgrim's Hospice Charity Shop, a piece depicting an exhausting looking medic. And then next to it is a message about the plastic issue damaging the world, which was painted on David Attenborough's birthday. Basically saying time is running out squeezing the life out of planet Earth. The area is most famous for its seafood, with oysters being the top choice. It started in 1856 when Richard Leggy Wheeler's wife, Mary Ann, opened Wheeler's Oyster Bar. I'm just imagining <laughs> Richard to be this tall, leggy guy being like, ooh, look at my legs. Today, it continues with Whistable Oyster Fishery Company, the Crab and Winkle, and the Forge. Oysters aren't really my thing being a vegetarian, but several stalls do offer shuck, as in open the oysters before your eyes, and then they serve it with a dash of Tabasco and lemon juice. Prices vary, but you'd expect to pay between one to two pounds per oyster. Beer is my thing though, and a quaint historic pub, you say, right on the beach with panoramic views? Well, that is the old Neptune. An ale house that looks to the sea. No seaside trip is completed without ice cream. Unfortunately, Sunday Sunday was closed and it's meant to be the best place for homemade ice cream. It includes daily specials. <laughs> Honestly, it was so sad. I really need to go back again to try their ice cream. Randomly in Whistable, there is a castle. Well, not so much as a castle, but as a manor house. It was built by Charles Pearson, a successful London business man and entrepreneur. And as it's between Whistable Town and the Tankerton Slopes, it's worth swimming by and having a look. You can't come to Whistable without visiting the street, which is a strip of coastline. It's 750 meters long to the tankage slopes, and you can enjoy a nice walk seeing the colorful beach huts and enjoy a sunset here. There is nothing worse than switching hotels constantly, so I decided to base ourselves in Canterbury. For the three nights, we stayed at Falstaff Hotel. It is an old building built in the 15th century, and it used to be a coaching inn. It still has many of the original features still intact, and it's perfect place to stay. Regrouping at the bar, I asked the staff for their recommendation or random facts about Canterbury, and I learned from the cathedral, there are tunnels that used to lead to the brothels back in the day. Now these are converted into pubs, and they are thinking of opening the tunnels up for tours en route to the pubs, which sounds fantastic. I really hope they get around to doing that. Can't forget the coffee place. Garage Coffee offers a range of options, including their house plan, single original espresso on rotation, and some different filter coffees. As it's roasted locally, you know their coffee is going to be fresh and good. Garage Coffee has stores in all three of these places. No trip to the city is complete without visiting the cathedral. The cathedral is the seat of Archbishop of Canterbury, although it's perhaps best known as the place of murder of Thomas Becket, who was killed by King Henry II's army in 1170. I had no idea about this and the staff members started asking me about it. 
And yeah, we weren't taught this in Australia. On my quest to find what locals really like to do, I asked for some more advice and it was unanimous. They all recommended to go chill in Westgate Park with some drinks and a picnic. However, it wasn't a great day for that. So I just went around and took some photos. Finishing the day off at Wild Goose for dinner. The restaurant is tucked away in the bustling farmer's market of the Good Shed. Their menu showcases the best of the farmer's market and their little tapas dishes are absolutely brilliant. I think we ended up with like five plates of croquettes. Like it was so good. And I finished that off with a gin cocktail. The last day was all about exploring Botany Bay and Margate. Botany Bay is a short drive or a 45 minute coastal walk from Margate. It's renowned for the bright white chalk cliffs and it's also a great swimming spot and you can escape the tourist hordes of Margate in the summer months. One of my biggest regrets here was not researching where to eat. Walking around the town center, there were so many cool places, but they were all booked out and I highly recommend booking in advance so you don't miss out. Starting at the end of the Harbour Arm Road, I discovered some good views, market pubs, and a cool vintage shop. You'll also see the lighthouse here. Walking back up the Harbour Arm, you will find the Turner Contemporary Museum. It's inspired by their namesake, J.M. W. Turner, who liked to see the skies and lights during his visit to Margate. The museum offers fantastic views of the ever-changing cityscape and a range of temporary exhibitions. On the new 20 pound note is Turner and two of the locations on that note is the Contemporary Art Museum and the Lighthouse, which is on Harbour Arm Road. So you know you're visiting some historic sites if it shows up on the UK's currency. Slightly across the road from the museum is the old Kent Market. It is based in an old cinema. They have restored this venue. Now it's full of food and drink places, as well as several pop-up arts and craft stalls and some permanent shops. Along the way, we found this really quirky bar called Fez. The interior was full of knickknacks, signs, old books, barber chairs, and all sorts of random things. It's a bit of an old school pub where you can simply just order a pint of beer or something simple like a gin and tonic. Now, you know how I love my coffee already. My favorite coffee roaster happens to be in Margate. So I had to visit their cafe. Kerr produces some of the best cups of coffee I've had here. And I really needed a flat white to gear me up for the next really, really weird attraction. When I saw the shell grotto as something I had to do on the list, I had to go. It's a really bizarre attraction. In 1835, it was discovered by some school children playing football. And now you can walk through the passageways with over 4.6 million shells. They are mosaiced on the wall showing gods and goddesses, trees and different patterns. No one knows why it was built, uh, but there are plenty of interesting theories behind it. For such a let's wing it trip, I honestly had a blast exploring these locations and I could easily go back. Next year, I definitely want to explore more of Margate because I feel like I've only just touched the surface. If you're looking for more destinations to visit, don't forget to watch this playlist on England.